Hello everyone and welcome to today's PhD Q&A. Uh, my name is Wale and I'm a student here at Loughborough, PhD student here at Loughborough in the business school studying IT leadership. And right here, right now, we're in beautiful Graduate House, which is a pretty much dedicated space for postgrads here at Loughborough. And I'm also joined by two special guests with me today, um, Chidima on my near left and Cheng on my far left. I'm going to start with Cheng. Um, do you want to tell me about yourself, your PhD and, you know, journey here so far? Okay, uh, I'm in my final year of PhD from chemical engineering, uh, and I did my master here in chemistry as well. And currently, my PhD project is mainly focused on the fuel cell catalyst. And yeah, so far so good. Awesome. And Chidima, yourself? Yeah, um, I'm in my third year of my PhD, um, based in the School of Social Sciences and Humanities, geography and subject, um, geography and environment subject area. Um, I also did my master's here in international relations, and um, I'm a student ambassador as well, and um, so many other things you probably get to find out in the course of answering your questions. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to start with the first question, and that's going to be for you, Cheng. Um, so the person says, I'm currently a master's student, and I'm planning on furthering my studies to a PhD after I complete my master's. May I ask for some advice on what to expect when I apply for a PhD? Uh, I would say the top advice if you decide you want a PhD, do it fast. Like we start a master at October, so you can search for your PhD around December, January time. Search early and contact the university and the supervisor early. That's always a good point. And then you have so many opportunities go like back and forth for different opportunities, different uh, subject and research groups. So that's definitely a good thing, I would say. And for you, when you did your master's, did you know you went to a PhD at that point or uh, afterwards? Actually, I didn't at that point. So that's why I suggest do it early. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I realized I was want to continue my kind of academic uh, for a PhD. I think it's in April time around. So it's not that early. So I have to say at that time, so many opportunities already closed. After that, you cannot submit mm -hmm. any application. And even if you contact the supervisor directly, they will say, oh, sorry, it's after the deadline, so I cannot take you. So that's why I say always do it early. Do the research early, yeah. contact the people early, yeah. Awesome, I mean, early timing always helps. Um, and actually, I think you mentioned point on the next question because mm -hmm. the next question says, should potential PhD applicants make direct contact with faculty members before applying? And I think that is almost a given. Um, if yeah, you, yeah if you just agree contact me. because like, when you see the description, it's only one or two paragraph on the website. It may sound really interesting to you, but when you actually contact the staff, the supervisor, and give them more details about the project, you may think, oh, it's maybe not what I'm really interested in for the next three, four, even five years. So you really need to find a topic that's really interesting you and you want to spend so many years on it. Yeah, yeah so definitely. Yeah, and exactly. You said if you're going to spend so many years on something, working with certain people, you want to know them at least yeah, bit, the, and you want yeah to the paper and the project crafty yes. step so you for Chidima like when you began your PhD did you search for your supervisors or how did you navigate that introductory phase yeah um it started first with deciding that I wanted to do a PhD and then um coming up with a topic that I was pretty much interested in um because just as you said three years or more is long to do something you're not interested in so um, it was very important for me to make sure that whatever it is I'm going to be dedicating that year's doing is something that um, I was interested in. So the moment I decided I wanted to do a PhD and I came up with a potential topic, um, the next step for me was to um, find potential supervisors. So, um, you know, I did my master's in international relations and I'm currently doing my PhD in geography. And one of the questions that I always get asked is, how did I transition from, actually from English, which was my first degree, to international relations and now in geography? And so for me, it was because my supervisors are based in geography. That was one of the uh, main reasons why I transitioned from IR to, to geography. So um, because the topic I wanted to do was something that you know they were already experts on yeah. and um and then when i made the, the contacts with them um i thought pretty much yeah th these, are, these, these are the people i want to be working with <laughs> and um and then i'd read more about 
I got to know more about geography um, yeah. as a discipline and I realized that it wasn't just about maps and um, that's the physical aspect of geography. Uh, there is a human and social aspect of it, which pretty much still aligns with some of the things that I had done in my um, master's in international relations. So it's very important to make that contact um, because your supervisors would be a huge part of your, your PhD journey um, and having a great relationship with them really um, really goes a long way to whether <laughs> you would finish that <laughs> PhD or not. Um, so yeah, I definitely would, will advise um, making those contacts early enough. Um, and then when you have done that and you know, you've know you come up with a topic, you've met your supervisors, you're convinced that this is something that you would um, want to do, then just go ahead and apply. I mean, when you said um, geography is all about maps, honestly, I felt that's something that I would say, <laughs> to be very honest. Um, but just going back to that point you raised, um, so what tips and advice would you give to make your application stand out? Because I know you did a proposal for your PhD. So just reflecting on that, what tips and advice would you give? Um, yeah, again, write a very pretty much strong uh, proposal that is convincing, um, you know, clearly show what contribution you hope to make um, to academic knowledge. Um, and um, I think one of the other things that probably h helped uh, my application stand out is having strong academic qualification. Um, so I had a first class in my first degree and a distinction in my master's. Um, now, I'm not saying if you don't have a first <laughs> class and a distinction, you don't stand a chance to do a PhD. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm just saying that having those strong academic qualifications um, would also make your application stand out. And just um, also coming up with a very strong uh, research proposal that clearly states out, you know, the aim of your research, um, the, the proposed contribution to knowledge. Um, and then my kind of research also has policy implications. So um, I think all of that all together um, did help to, to make the application mm. stand out. Mm. And I think just after that, I think it's also good to demonstrate to your supervisors, potential supervisors, that you know the literature around the area. Right, so that shows them that you've done good reading at least, and yeah, almost ahead of the game in, in that respect. So that always helps. Um, so now on to funding a PhD. Um, this one pretty much says, how can I fund my tuition fees? Right, so I'm going to start with um, Cheng on this one. Um, so you can talk, tell me about how, you know, your tuition fee, how is that funded and what's your journey? Uh, for myself, I'm self-funded, so it's felt. Uh, I mean, tuition fee is funded by my family, by my parents, and for the living expense, I just do a lot of like part-time jobs during my PhD here, and yeah, definitely get some fund from parents as well. So that's how self-fund student will be. So I, I know there's definitely lots of funded project and student that which they will cover by maybe for engineering side, most of it will be covered by EC, uh, ESPRC, yeah. and then there will be always. If you're an international student, you just your own country, the government or department may have yeah. some opportunities. Yeah. yeah, I think I think I have some French engineering who are covered, but I think you said is ERCRC. EPSRC. My apologies, yeah. my, my engineering knowledge is, is, <laughs> is, is not up to par, so sorry about that if I butchered the name. But yeah, you mentioned this kind of budget. Yeah, yeah. You that's one of the government, main government main loans yeah. as well. That's by the UK government, yeah. Yeah, but you should imagine you're on the flip side, you're on a university funded okay. studentship, yeah. So. And what is that? Um, <laughs> so Loughborough University um, have a couple of scholarships um, available to, to do a PhD. Um, and I think it's rolled out across schools. So the year that I applied, we had about six um, slots um, within the School of Social Sciences and Humanities. And so Again, I don't know how they distribute that, but it will be distributed within the different subject areas and then invite um, applicants um, to, to apply. So I did apply for that, um, and, and that's the one that I got. So there's the university um, studentship, um, but he, he had already mentioned there's a government um, funded, um, different countries have different options. Um, there is also the Commonwealth scholarships, which by the way, that's what my PhD research <laughs> is on. Um, so the UK um, offers fully funded uh, scholarship to citizens of Commonwealth um, uh, countries uh, to come to the UK to study at master's and PhD level. So if you are within the Commonwealth, um, 
you might as well just search the information and apply and you might just get it. So those are the options. Yeah. Um, and in my case, it was quite similar to yours because mine was an advertised project that I found on um, jobs.ac.uk and, uh, and it was advertised, it was love presidentship as when I applied for it. I went to an interview, just like a job, and I got it, um, thankfully. <laughs> um, <laughs> next question, how do you fund your living expenses? Uh, so I'll start by saying sometimes, uh, I think if you are on a studentship or a fund or a government loan, that tends to come with stipends sometimes. So that would, you know, give you some expenses on a monthly basis. Um, on the flip side, if you don't have that, Again, I think you mentioned earlier, it's part-time jobs yeah. that, that um, PhDs take on. So sometimes that could be on the campus, like, you know, academic work, teaching, um, marking sometimes, invigilations when things are normal. And by normal, I mean non-COVID times. Um, and uh, things like what we're doing right now, student ambassador. Um, but also, I know a couple of friends also work outside of the university as well. Yeah, local shop, supermarket, yeah. restaurant. Yeah, so many options. Yeah, so there's quite a bit of options in the funding fun your living expenses. Um, is it possible for international students to work part time while studying? Um, yes, definitely. Um, you definitely can work. I know international students are only. I mean, I don't know if if all countries, but I know we are on a twenty yeah, hour a week a restriction. Yeah. So as long as you're within that range, I think you're fine. Um, the, the, the other thing about that is just that sometimes as a PhD student, you tend to be, depending on your on your stipend, on your um, funded body, your body that's funding you, they might give you restrictions on what you can do and what you can do. Yeah. So it could be that they limit that to, say, you know, six hours or something like that. So it also depends on that. But generally speaking, yeah. um, we've, we have 20 hours per week restriction on work, and so we definitely can't work. Anyone have any other thoughts on that? Uh. Not really. I think for international students like us, yeah, it's all on the T4 visa. Yeah. So yeah, we have 20, 20 hours limitation. Awesome. So let's move on to um, student life. Woohoo. Um, so as a PhD student, right, full-time or part-time, how much do you need to spend on campus? I'm going to start with you, Jidima. How much do I spend on campus? Pretty much. <laughs> how much oh. do you need to spend on campus? Oh, do you need to spend on campus? Um, I think it depends on the individual and the department you're in and the project you're working on. Um, I know some people who have lab-based um, projects spend a lot more time on campus. Change not in head. It's like, yeah, that's In me. the lab, <laughs> working. Um, where if yours is like field-based, so I was in Nigeria for almost seven months doing field work. Um, you don't have to be on campus because you have to be in the field. Um, collecting data. Um, so I think it depends on the individual, depends on the project you're working on, the department you're in. Um, and then if you're also like me, who just, I, I like to live on campus. I mean, throughout my educational life, my undergraduate, master's, and now currently as a PhD um, student, um, I've, I've lived on campus. So which means I'm pretty much on campus, whether I'm doing PhD or time. not. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it, it boils down to um, the individual, it boils down to your project, your department, and that would depend, uh, determine how long you, you spend on campus or mm. not. Yeah. Chang, how about you? Yeah, definitely. Like I told myself before, I'm lab based. So actually, I come to the university, come to office and lab every day. Sometimes I still remember there's like one month period I spent like from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. for the whole month. That's wow. that's really tired, I have to say. But after that, sometimes when you finish your stage of project, then you have a relaxed time. Yeah. So during this relaxed time, I always say I never come to campus. I just stay at home and doing my analyze, doing my report, saying, yeah, it's really depend. I do know like some of my friends, they're doing simulation based. So they just stay at home for almost all the time. So they don't have to uh, come to campus to access any facilities or equipment. So yeah, it really depends by your project and by your department. So. And, and for those who can work on campus, some people decide to work from home as well. So maybe your work is knowledge based. You don't really need to come. Actually, you prefer working from home, don't you? I do. Because yeah. I, I work overnight. So um, my timing is always very tricky. Um, yeah. So I prefer. I pre when when my friend would say when, when the world is asleep that's when Chidima is awake <laughs> and then when the world is awake that's when I'm asleep I'm so. surprised you're here today <laughs> <laughs> I had to I mean for the love of love bro that's why I'm here um, but yeah because of the the time that I, I prefer to work overnight is calm is 
quiet, less mm. distracting. Um, so I, most times um, I work from home. I'm quite the opposite. I prefer the office. Um, I need that energy um, to get me going, really. Working from home can be a blur sometimes. I mean, I, I was surprised that I actually managed to productive throughout the summer given what was happening but you know yeah yeah it's a very really different vibe in the office like the colleagues sitting next to you you can discuss something yeah. maybe during the day or like maybe just to have carrot chat it's really different yeah I'm, I'm, yeah I'm just gonna add there's a flip side to that you know sometimes when when you come into the office and then you spend a lot of time chatting and <laughs> and yeah, saying hello to know. colleagues <laughs> and before you know it you spent two hours doing nothing um sure. so it just it's just Definitely figuring out what works for you. Yeah, absolutely. And then, yeah, going with that. Absolutely. How would you recommend finding people to live with for someone new to London or Loughborough that doesn't know other people there? Um, so I think for London, it's, it might be... So there's two aspects of the London case. So finding somewhere to live and finding people, mm -hmm. right, might be easier, yeah, right, definitely. given the fact that London has more people by default. But I'm not sure how much London's um, accommodation... Um, demand is high or low um, but I know that typically um, people have um, group chats and uh, and then um, new entrants Facebook groups that they join and they find friends and find houses together so it's about finding people that you that you know people that you know you just got here you want to live and find a house with you can join those Facebook group chats where you have new offer holders who come on there together um, and again for London because you are in this buzz of a city you also meet people, you might meet people like in normal daily activities than you might do in Loughborough. Yeah. You know, but in Loughborough as well, we also have our campus side as elementary, whereby it's a student town in, in that respect. So um, you also have those options to use those group chats to meet people and find places to live. But also because it's a student town, it's likely that your housemates, there's a chance, there's a higher chance that they'll be a student than they will be in London if you were in London. Yeah. All right? What do you guys think? Yeah, I think. I think you've pretty much yes. covered it. And also just to add that our um, campus leaving team, that's the accommodation um, center, they are also quite um, helpful because um, I know that they, they don't just advise only for campus-based accommodation, um, but also they liaise with some agents in town. Yeah, landlord, yeah. Yeah, that's true. so yeah. In, if if you're also looking for um, such opportunities, um, I think it might be best and safe <laughs> to, yeah. Yeah, to, yeah. to contact. They've got um, like a web dedicated website for the yeah. local landlord. They've been approved by our accommodation centre, and accommodation centre staff will check them annually to make sure the safety stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's just a good place to start, to be honest, because they would even give you some... Um, communities around already so maybe yeah. we might have a PhD community already you can tap into to ask questions if that comes up what are the best ways to make friends for people new to the UK through the university or other methods mm. Cheng? Mm, I would say wherever you are where you're from it's always possible to find someone like apply for the same city or the same university with you so always have those pre UK friends, mm -hmm. we always a good thing, and then we always we are we already know like uh, our university provides a Facebook ch uh, groups for new offer holders to join. So that's definitely another way to uh, networking with and meet make some new friend. And yeah, I would say we actually arrive UK or arrive in Loughborough. Don't worry, you will get to know lots of people in very few days, and you will make a lot of new friends. Yeah, don't worry about that too much. Yeah. And I, I think, I mean, I agree with you, but I think one, one thing I want to point out is you have to be deliberate about it. And I, and I say that because as an undergrad, it is almost by default because you're put in situations whereby you meet people by default. Yeah. As a master's student, you're being taught. So your first bunch of environment that you engage with is your class. So that's that's one place to start with. But as a PhD, you know, that's, that's not that. I think level. that's the people you in the office and around you. Exactly. Be, yeah. Right. And then your office you probably might have definitely fewer numbers that you have in your class for masters. Yeah. So your options are then going down that way. So you have to deliberate. You know, you have to you have to find avenues to put yourself out there. And it is kind of also weird because PhDs tend to be a lot more busy than your typical master's student. So that then gives you less chances to, you know, make friends. So you know when I start start where well, you have to pick either social life or work or your studies 
you have to find a way to have that balance at the start because um it is it's not going to be as default as it will be to your masters yeah, that's true. i'm saying that from experience at least but the good thing is love pro has we have a lot of um phd clubs networks that we engage yeah. with yeah. and the faculties are very very um close there's the subboarding groups that we chat to there was the phd support network that we engage with so those kind of events kind of help so i'll say you can start by looking at those kind of places and mm -hmm. on campus and seeing what communities are there that i can engage yeah. with even graduate house organizes events yeah. right but you have to go there yeah, right you, yeah, you have um, to go you have to go that that. yeah you know? and i was just going to add that you know there's the induction which is yeah. pretty much the first thing you know once you, you know, once you get started um it gives that opportunity to meet other phd um starters um and then as you mentioned there are clubs and societies um there is a local church if you're a christian because that's where i've met some of the friends that you know i have now for life um and uh yeah there are those opportunities that you can tap into yeah. but very very important what you said about being deliberate um once you're deliberate about it that's when you probably even get to know some of these opportunities yeah. and then um make the friends yeah absolutely um what support is available to students phd students at university what support so i'm guessing that's academic and maybe other forms of support so um i'll start by saying what they always say to us is your first form of support is your supervisors um because they are the people who not that you report to but they're the ones who should know how you're doing on a on a daily weekly monthly basis right and they can also signpost to to places where that might help you but beyond that we've also got student services um you know in terms of support for mental well-being mm -hmm. um counseling and stuff and um, someone made a joke and said you know phds tend to need that the most but, but they don't go <laughs> very <laughs> true though very very I'm true right. yeah <laughs> very true um, but um, but i mean that exists um they're dead and they're definitely i mean i know i know i've, I've gone for session session before and it was very useful in um, my first year and um, there's also the financial support as well for the hardship fund for um i don't know actually i'm not sure if the hardship funds um, apply to phd students it, it can be yeah yeah it's open to okay there we go so that that's what exists um, there's a lot of other support services do you guys yeah. know of any others I, I, I was gonna say one of the things that and this is not some free advert for love bro or you know <laughs> in my role as a student ambassador this is just real experience and one of the things i love about love bra is the support you know um there is support at every level um if you live in halls there's a sub warden team they're there for you if you live off campus there's the off campus you know yeah, um, community team warden, yeah. community wording you know at at your phd level you've got your supervisors even within the department within the school at the central level you've got the well-being team so it's like there is support everywhere yeah. Um, and what I tell people is, you know, just like what you said about being deliberate is it's not left for you to, to find out what kind of support you want and then tap into it. Yeah. So there is a financial support, there is a mental health support, there is a supervisory support. Um, and that is one of the things that I, I, I like about, I like about it here, um, at Loughborough It's like, you're never alone. Um, and so, as I said, I, I needed to add that caveat at the, at the, at the, at the point it's like oh she's been she's been paid to say that no um so the support is out there and and the, the hardship fund is 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 um is open to everyone um obviously you would have to have a case um before before you can get it because you have to apply there are a lot of people um who might also be applying alongside so yeah um, those are the avail and then there's a social aspect as well, yeah. um, where you have the PhD, yeah. the peer-to-peer -peer support and the PhD um, social and support network. Um, the doctoral college also yeah. um, is is very supportive. Um, there was a, an event that they recently organized, um, which um, I did give a presentation at that event, and it was just trying to help um, uh, s s support staff understand better the PhD experience and life so that they can better support PhD um, students. And I think, you know, having to go to that length, what it, what it tells me is that the university is trying to make an effort here mm -hmm. to make sure that we are well supported. Um, so, yeah. Okay, um, I think it's funny, I think that leads to the next question. What are some of the favorite opportunities 
extracurricular activities that Love Pro offers. So like, let me start with you, Cheng. If it's normal daily social activities, yeah, I also like what we just discussed. Always offer so many opportunities, and I would say, since Loughborough is quite famous for sports anyway, so you got different level of sports activities throughout the year for different sports. So yeah, it's always something good you can get involved in. Yeah, for, I mean, if a really good top players,、so、you can go to the AU as the yeah. uni. Yeah, that's a Represent university to play for the university, and then we go down to my lifestyle and RMS. That's much relaxed environment, and even if you don't actually play any sports, you go to a CBA coaching and volunteer academy. Yeah, lots of volunteer opportunity, coaching qualification or official qualification. Yeah, just go for have a try, try something new. It's always opportunities. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's a sport university, and I、yeah. would say even if you're not sporty, you can. Yeah, you can never miss any sports.、Uh, you cannot. You can come here and not do sport, but you can come here and try sport. Yeah. <laughs> come here and do not sport. do sport. No, yes, same. Don't I don't do sports. <laughs> no, but like you coach, you coach. No, no, no I officiate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just do that part, but I don't actually play any sport. I would say that counts. <laughs> I would say that counts. Well, Cause, it's cause really because making the game happen, right? So yeah, that's really that happy because like. For me, I'm I'm both badminton and tennis、uh, umpire and referee. So before I start here, my student pathway for get those license. I just I only watch, watch on the TV, watch on the YouTube. So I never thought I could actually be that person in the chair、yeah. at the top. But then it just just look through the website, the CVA website to see what they advertise, and they just the two pathway come pop pop up. So yeah, why not? It's a really good chance. Yeah, so to get involved in a different view of sports. Yeah, I mean, hats off to you, man. Like, because I, I know you told me the last time that you 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 were chosen to go to Wimbledon. Oh yeah, yeah, this year, twenty twenty, but yeah, like, it's been cancelled, unfortunately. But I'm、oh, pretty sure next year I'll be selected yeah, again. Yeah. yeah. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. And、um, but also like we mentioned、um, sports, but there's also things like our academic groups are mentioned that you can participate in. So not always.、Um, Peer to peer, but even joining um, um academic groups, your lecturers as well. So I know in my department we have like seminars that we organize amongst ourselves according to a discipline group. You must also have you know your PGSSN events and groups that you join, but also you can engage with things like you know um just societies in the university. You、right? know it's it's interesting. Um, you know, sometimes I get involved in so many committees that. <laughs> I actually forget that because, <laughs>、um, like, as you were talking, I just remember that I actually signed up for LSU Action、um, Uganda、okay. project. So、um, you know, Action you can get involved in different you know charity um, events, um, and so this year、um, I wanted to get involved with the、um, the overseas event, and then they have this. Particular project where they go to Uganda to support、um, an NGO called Calm Africa.、Uh, they run a school for children, and so we'll be there for three weeks, assisting with teaching and and all of that. And so, it was something that you know I was pretty much I thought、mm, I want to I want to give this a go.、Um, and so and there's an ex- a- a exciting part of fundraising、um, where we we raise funds for for this NGO. And and so I signed up for it,、yes. and so I am looking forward to going to Uganda next year. I hope COVID lets us.、Um, and so it's just one of those opportunities that yes, PhD students are busy, but the opportunities are there yeah, for yeah, us、yeah. to tap into.、Yeah. And as I wanted to sign up, nobody said you can't sign up because you're a PhD. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. is is. Is the opportunities are there? So it's up to you to find out what it is you like, what it is you want, and then just tap into the opportunities.、Um, well, final <laughs> question though: What is the best thing about studying a PhD at Loughborough University? Okay,、um, let me start. So I'm going to ask all of us to answer, but I'll just start by saying:、um, So I think for me, it's just being very, very close to the academic side of things, and in the sense of. Me being me, me being a student here doing a PhD, I've been exposed to seminars that I've met some people in industry and some academics, right? And I think that reflects the fact that academics here are quite internationally recognised as well. So, and as a PhD, as I always say, you're a junior academic trying to learn the game of academia. So that's a good starting point to be in that environment, right? Because you learn as you do in most cases, and but also it's the peers that are around me as well, right? I think 
we do have a group of PhD students who not just like-minded, but different thinking, and you learn through that. And we're quite supportive because I'm surprised with the number of support groups that we just create on our own and just bash again and we just give ourselves a name and we are all together. And that's amazing because I, 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 that, I don't think that's everywhere, which is great. And it makes your experience a lot more livable. It makes your experience a lot more worthwhile. So I think those two things are one thing I like most of our love, bro. How about you, Chidima? Yeah, I think it's just that whole package um, for me um, because I did my master's here and you can tell that I liked it for me to have come back, <laughs> for me to have come back to do my PhD. And Loughborough has become like that, you know, home away from home. But I've always been this sort of student right from my undergrad that isn't just about the academia or academics. Um, I've always wanted to do other stuff alongside. And so Loughborough just gives me that opportunity, you know, where I can be a sub warden, I can be a student ambassador, you know, I can sign up for LSU Action Uganda project. And I can still do my PhD, I can still attend conferences, you know, there's the trainings. Um, if there's something that, you know, I wanted to do that I'm not quite sure about how to go about it, I can always contact the doctoral college. They've got training programs, you know, that can train you. So it's just that whole package, you know, where I can leave out that student experience to the full. And then if I want to do the social aspect as well, you know, we can have the PhD, SSN, you know, night out and just relax and... So Loughborough just gives me that feel. And as I said, throughout my undergrad, I've always been a campus, on-campus person, you know, so, and I live on campus. I get to do all of that. And it just gives me that full experience such that when I'm done with my PhD, and if I decide to go work in the industry, I can look back and say, yeah, I, I did have a holistic student experience. And, and yeah, that is it for me. Awesome, awesome. Cheng? Cool, I would say similar, like, with Chidima said, the package, I would just, I would, I would u- like to use the common word, we would say, love for family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not just two words, it's a real concept. Like, I did my, I actually, I came here five years ago as an exchange student, and then I decided to stay for master and then PhD. It's like when new friends, when they know, like, I have to stay here for so long time, they say, oh, that's how I know you love this place, yeah? <laughs> yeah I, I say, yeah, definitely, yeah, I really love the place. Not just academic, academia part, but also the general support and the opportunity, we all just said so many opportunities, like he signed up for those international uh, action stuff. And for me, I got my uh, tennis and badminton stuff. That's, uh, that can't be done anywhere. Also, it's really good to be here for both your project, your research, but also your lifetime interest. Yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, thanks, guys. That's really great. And uh, thanks to everyone who's listened. And we hope you found the questions very useful, um, very, very understanding and very, very applicable to you. And we hope to see you soon and welcome you on board to Love for at some point. Take care and stay safe.